Amen. Good evening. Um, as Grant said, my name is Nsawo Gumete, and uh, it's a great privilege and an honor for me to be standing here tonight to be sharing with you what I believe God has placed in my heart for us to, to talk about. And so I was just thinking about this time, and we're, we're nearing the end of the year. This is the last Sunday in 2019. And so I was just thinking about coming towards the end and, and, and what that means. And, and this is probably the time that most people reflect. They look back on the year and they say, okay, this is what I've done right, and this is what I've done wrong. Uh, my, my biggest wrong came a couple of days ago. Um, I think on Thursday, we were with my cousins bowling. And I don't know, I've been bowling a couple of times, so I'm not, I'm not new to it. I'm not the greatest, but I'm not new to it. And so we're, we're bowling, and, and so I decided to go last. There was five of us. I was last. And, and I go up, and I bowl my first, my first ball, and I hit one pin. I'm like, okay, that's fine. I've got a second ball, you know, I can still do this. And, and my second ball comes and got a ball. So at the end of my first round, I've got one. Second round comes, okay, I'm like, you know what, this is redemption round. I go both balls gutter. I was like, what? Third round, I gutted balled for the first five rounds. And I, was, I felt like quitting at some point. But, but that was probably my lowest moment in the year. But, but people reflect. <laughs> that was. Um, but, but people tend to, to reflect on the year and what they've done right. And, and I started thinking of one day when I get towards the end of my life. And I reflect and I look back. Will I look back on my life and be happy with what I've accomplished, with what I've done, or will I be sad? I took it a step further. If I look at my journey with Jesus, one day when I'm near the end of my life, will I look back and I'll be happy with what I've done with Christ, or will I be sad? Will you one day when you look back on, on, on what you've done with your life, with your journey with Jesus, will you look back and be happy, or will you be sad? And, and I thought of it, and, and the thing is, our intentions don't determine our, dire- our, our, our destination, but the path we're on determines our destination. You see, I can have all the, the good intentions to, to be this great guy when I, when I get to the end of my life, but my intentions don't necessarily get me there. But it's the path that I'm on that gets me there. And so tonight, I want us to talk about how do we get to the end of our lives and when we reflect back and see that what we've done is good and we're, and we're happy with what we've done. One of the guys, when he speaks, he puts it like this. He wants to be better at 70. He wants to know Jesus better. He wants to love Jesus better. He wants to love people better. He wants to care for people better. He wants to be a better person at 70. And so for lack of a better title, I'd like to title my message, Better at 70. Can we pray? Father, I thank you, Jesus, that you are in this place tonight. Father, I pray won't you speak to me and to your children. Father, I pray, let me not speak a word of my own knowledge, but only of your heart. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, why don't you turn with me to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, we'll read from verse 14. So this is a very famous parable that Jesus taught. And, and it, read like, it reads like this. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them his property. To the one he gave five talents, to another he gave one ta- two talents, and to the other he gave one, according to his ability. He went away, and he who had received five talents traded them, and he made five more. And the one who had made two ta- got two talents made five, two more. But the one who received one talent dug a hole and hid his master's money in the ground. Now after a long time, the master of the servants comes back and comes to settle the accounts. And he who received five talents came forward, bringing the five more talents, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five more. The master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over the little. I will set over you much. Enjoy, enter into your your master's joy. And he who had gotten two talents came forward, and he said, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two more. And the master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over the little. I will set over you much. Enter into your master's joy. And he who had received one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter. So I was afraid and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, what is yours? 
And so in this parable, we, we find this guy who, who gives his, his servants a bit of money, I believe. And, and he goes away for a little while and he comes back and he says, okay, what have you done with what I've given you? What have you done with what I've entrusted to you? And so the guy with the five got five more. The guy with the two got two more. But the guy with the one hid his talent. And so I'd like us to, to make a few observations from the story. And the first one is that in order for us to be better at 70, we need to know the giver. We need to know the giver. Verse 24 reads, And he who had received one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you did not gather, where you did not scatter. Our view of God will determine how well our relationship with God will go. Our view of God will determine how well our relationship with God will go. You see, if, if I just know God at surface level, or if I just know God because of someone else's experiences, if I just know Jesus because of, of what I've heard, then I won't be able to be better at 70. If I just know Jesus because I, I've, I've seen my friend and he says, oh, God is a provider, but I haven't seen God as a provider. If I just know God because my friend says God is faithful, but I haven't sought out to see God be faithful in my life, I will not be better at 70. The servant says, I knew you to be a hard man. And, and I believe some of us here, there are some, some places in our lives where, where we're saying, God, I know you to be dot, dot, dot. I know you to be distant. I know you to be far away from me. I know you to be hard. Or whatever it is be, but in our hearts, we have our own. I know you to be God. I know you to be God. And you see, the thing is with those things is that there are usually two places where it comes from. Firstly, it usually comes from someone else's experiences or they're just lies that we've chosen to believe. It's, e it's either we're living off someone else's relationship or someone else's experiences with God and we're saying, okay, if that happened to them, then it's surely going to happen to me. Or otherwise, we've heard lies from circumstances. We've heard lies from situations that say, no, because X, Y, and Z is happening to you, maybe that means God doesn't love you. Because we've heard lies and, and because X, Y, and Z is happening, and maybe that means you've, you've done something wrong and God is away from you. And, and these are lies from situations that are trying to tell us that God is different to what he says in his word. But if we know the giver, if we have a relationship with the giver, we won't listen to lies. We won't listen to circumstances because we know who the giver is. In Daniel chapter 3, we find probably one of my favorite stories in the Bible of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so they were exiles in Babylon. And, and so King Nebuchadnezzar builds this gold, golden idol. And he says, everyone in the land is going to pray to it. And so the time comes and, and he, I, I don't know, I think he blows the trumpet. And everyone is supposed to pray to this idol at this point. And so when they're supposed to pray, these guys decide to not pray. They're like, nope, we're not going to do that. And so, and so the king calls them. He's like, listen, guys, I'm going to give you one more chance. Pray to this idol. Or else, otherwise, I'm going to throw into the fire. And these guys, and I love their response. They're saying that we cannot bow down to another God because we know our God will fight for us. But, but here's where it gets good. Even if he doesn't, we will still go into the fire. And, and I believe that when we know the giver, even if circumstances go wrong, we will still go into the fire because we know who the giver is. Even if, even if things don't go right, we will go in because we know who the giver is. We know that the giver is with us. You see, if we're gonna, if we're gonna be better at 70, we need to move from just knowing about Jesus to following Jesus. We need to move from just knowing that Jesus died on the cross and, and he died for my sins, but, but actually following Jesus. The Bible, Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. He doesn't say, look at me on my cross and what I've done and you get to heaven, but just sit where you are. And he says also, okay, now that you're in the kingdom of heaven, pick it up and follow me. You see, in Mark chapter 10, we find a story. Jesus was, was walking with his disciples, and this, this rich young man comes to him, and he, and he says, Lord, how do I inherit, good teacher, how do I inherit the kingdom of heaven? And so Jesus says, you must follow the Ten Commandments, and he says, I've done it all. And then he says, okay, sell all you have and follow me. And the young man, disheartened, he walked away because he couldn't sell because he had a lot of possessions. You know, when I read that, that parable, I don't think it was about the amount of money the young man had. But it, it was about what he's willing to give up to have Jesus. 
And, and I feel like there are some things that God is saying, sell that and follow me. And, and it may not be money, but it, it may be sell your love for comfort and follow me. Sell your love for being safe and follow me. Sell your love for, for being in that comfortable place and follow me. You see, the Bible says you must love people. And, and this, this is what always blows my mind is that Jesus says you must love your neighbors, you love yourselves. And everyone is my neighbor. And, and this one day, I remember I was driving and this taxi driver cuts me off. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> but, but I need to love that guy like I love myself. We need to love the people that, that don't love us like we love ourselves. And that's when we're following Jesus. That's when we're picking up our cross and following and not just knowing about him. My second observation is that fear hinders our progress. Fear hinders our progress. In verse 25, this is what he says. I was so afraid, I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. And sometimes, in order for us to be, to be better at 70, we need to get over our fear of stuff, our fear of people, our fear of circumstances, our fear of what's going to happen in the future. We need to get over fear in order to be better at 70. This is what the Bible says in, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. It says, for God gave us a, a, a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Jesus has given us a spirit of power. He's given us a spirit of love. He's given us a spirit of self-control. But how many of you know there are moments when you just get scared? I know what the Bible says, but there are some moments where I just get scared. I get scared. I'm just like, Jesus, how do I do this? How do I navigate through this? There are moments in life where things just get scary. I remember back in grade eight, there was this program that they did at school. And a group of guys came to do activities with us. And so one of the activities was, was zip lining. So I remember a couple of my friends went, and, uh, went zip lining, and, and I was at the bottom. I got my harness strapped in. I was like, you know, I'm ready to do this. I climbed up to the top. I think it was like 10, 15 meters high. And so all the way up, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm good. I can do this. I'm ready. And as soon as I got to the top, I was strapped on. I was, I was supposed to jump. I was like, nope, I can't do this. And... I think I stood there for like 15 minutes. I, did, I didn't go. People down there were, were shouting at me, like, go, or just climb down, you know, whatever. But I was, I was scared. Eventually, this guy, I don't know what he said, but he talked some sense into me, and I jumped. And it was probably the, my, one of my favorite things that I've ever done. You see, on the other side of fear, there's freedom. On the other side of fear, there is so much joy. And we need to be able to, to get up and get over that fear. We need to be able to, to say, look, this is the situation, but on the other side of this, there is Jesus. You see, one of my favorite stories in the Bible, I have a lot, by the way, but, <laughs> but is, is the story of the Israelites when they get to the Jordan River. And so as they get to the Jordan River, they, they're supposed to cross on the other side, but it was flood season, so the water was rushing hard. And so, and so this is what uh, Joshua says. He says that, the, the Levites must carry the ark and go in front of the people, stand in the middle of the Jordan, and then the people will cross over to the other side. And so the Levites go in, water stops flowing two miles up, and then they walk over to the other side, and then they follow from the back. And, and what I love about that picture, because firstly, if you look at the ark, it's a picture of Jesus. Because it's got the Ten Commandments, it's got a staff, and it's got manna. It's a picture of who Jesus is. And, and this is what I love. Jesus goes ahead of us. He stands in the middle of the storm. And he walks out on the, on behind us on the other side. And even when we're facing fear, Jesus will go ahead. He will stand in the middle with us and come out on the other side. If we just trust in him. What is it that you're afraid of doing? What is it that God has given you and you've hidden in the ground? Where God has said, here, I want you to do this, but you've... Said, God, I'm afraid I'm going to hide this in the ground and one day I'm just going to give it back to you. I believe God is calling us to take those things out of the ground and go forward and boldly with it because he is with us. Like Ezekiel spoke to the dry bones and told them to come alive, we get to tell these things to come alive in our lives. And so that one day when we look back, we will be happy. So that one day we will be better at 70.
we will look back on our lives and say, we did it well. We were confident, we were brave, and we did it. We did not fear. We knew who the giver was, and we were not afraid. Can I pray? Holy Spirit, I, I thank you, Father, that you're in this place. I thank you, Jesus, that you're speaking into our hearts. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you help us know you more. Help us know you, the giver, more each and every single day. And Lord God, in, in those situations where fear has overcome us, Father, I pray for the freedom of Christ to come this, this very instant. I pray that Jesus may come and bring us freedom, may come and bring us joy, may come and bring us peace. You are good in your God, and we bless your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Hold on, Toba. It's an amazing thing when God gets hold of a guy's life when he's really young, eh? And uh, you did really well there, brother. Keegs, if you would come up, please. So this is, uh, this is Keegan. This is what I would look like if I had hair. And uh, Keegs is uh, 17. He's a school still. And um, both these guys are some of the preachers that they used at uh, Fusion on a Friday night. And uh, we felt this evening that we just wanted to hear what God's saying through young guys as we close the year. So, Father, we lift you to you. Make you speak through him. Anoint him. In Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Good evening, everyone. So, um, if you guys don't know me, as my dad said, I'm Keegan Crawford. Um, often I get introduced as grandson, but tonight, Dad, you're my father. Um, so... Yeah, I, I'm a PK. I've um, been brought up in the church since day one. I've been born into a pastor's family, and I've loved every single minute of it. I'm, I'm super grateful for the family I've been born into. Um, yeah, so that's about me. I'll get straight into it. I'm a very, very deep person. I'm a very personal, deep person. And um, I'm not sure if you guys have those friends, but as soon as you see someone, they want to have a DMC with you. That's, that's me. I'm one of those friends. I've got lots of those friends, but I'm also that friend. That as soon as I see you, hey, listen, we're having a personal conversation right now. Um, so, so, so that's me. Um, so can I get personal with you guys tonight? Is that all right? If I open myself up a little bit. Okay, cool. So I'm going to share a little bit of my testimony. All the Fusion guys are probably saying, oh, you're sharing this one again. Like, I've heard his injury so many times. But I honestly believe that a testimony shared once isn't a testimony shared to its fullest. Because every single time we share a testimony, it can minister to someone in a different way. So last year, July... Um, I just came back from international tour from Sri Lanka playing cricket, and there was two weeks before my season started back in St. Charles, and I was super, super excited, and then two weeks after that, I would have a big tournament, like one of the biggest tournaments of my career, and I was so, so keen, but I had a warm-up game against the touring team from Joburg, and I felt something in my back, and I was like, flip, what is this in my back? So I went to the physio, the physio said, you need to go get a uh, cortisone injection from an orthopedic surgeon in Gateway. I think that's what the surgeon's name is. Um, so I went down to Gateway, one of the best surgeons there, and um, he put the injection in me, very big needle. Um, and then he said, okay, go enjoy yourself for an hour at Gateway and come back and I have the scan ready for you. So I come back and um, you know that, you know that uh, moment when you're sick, but you want to do something cool, so you pretend you're not to your parents. So they gave me the injection, and while I was on my way to Gateway, because it was like a road away, I was walking there, I was practicing my action and telling my dad, hey, dad, I'm ready, I can play, this is so cool. And my dad is like, okay, let's just see what the scans say. And I go back to the scans, and the doctor says, Keegan, I've got some very bad news for you. You're not going to play, play this tournament. And I was like, that's so hectic. I'm like 15 years old. It's like the biggest tournament of my life. It like, it's going to depend on what I do in my future. It's not really that important, because I'm 15 years old. But in the moment, I was like, flip, this is like everything. Um, so I was like, but at least I'll play the season, right? And he's like, no, you're going to be injured for six to nine months. And I was like, flip, that is so hectic. Um, so on the way back from, from Gateway, I contemplated this thought, what is my calling? What is my anointing? And I honestly feel like one day if I'm playing cricket and I get injured for life, this is the question I was asking myself, what have I been called, what have I been anointed by Christ to do? It's a question everyone asks themselves. In 10 years' time, who am I going to marry? In 10 years' time, what are my kids going to look like? In 10 years' time, what is my job going to be? On my dad's instance, where is he going to retire to? So we all asking this question, what have I been called or what have I been anointed to do? 
And I honestly believe this. All jokes aside, I honestly believe that our anointing and our calling can only be heard from the voice of God. Because in actual fact, it's got nothing to, our calling and our anointing has got nothing to do with what we're seeing in our life, but it's got everything to do with what God is saying over our life. And we can all believe and we can all say that God is constantly speaking. He's speaking through everyone, but sometimes we're talking too much. Like I, apparently, Katie says it, I talk way too much. Um, I just sound like I'm blabbering half the time. Um, but often we, we want to hear something from God, but sometimes we're talking too much. But we see, in, um, we see in Jeremiah, when he was a teenager, he became a king. But it, it, it reads in Jeremiah 1, it says that before he was formed in his womb, God set him apart to rule kings and kingdoms. That's, that was spoken to, to over Jeremiah's life. It also says that, that Moses was called at the burning bush. God called him at the burning bush. And tonight we're going to be talking about the, the story of Joshua. So if you guys have a Bible, please turn to the story of Joshua, Joshua chapter 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving to them, the people of Israel. Every place that your sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river and the river, that river, all the land of Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. In that moment, God called Joshua to lead Israel. I'm not saying God's called us to be the president of South Africa. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that when God speaks, he can speak a calling over our lives. When God speaks, he speaks the anointing over our lives. And the biggest question everyone asks is, Keegan, how do we know it's God's voice? How do we know it's Jesus? And I've got the most simple answer is, how do you know your BFF's voice? You spend time listening to them. You spend time with them. And I've got quite a funny story about this. So back in my, um, my injury state, uh, last December 31st, I was a little bit of a rebel. You know what I'm saying? I was at a New Year's party. New Year's party with my dad and all the elders. Um, but I was there, and, <laughs> and I thought I was getting a little bit too boring, to be honest. So my cousin bought me these black spiders, these little grenade-type fireworks. They're not supposed to be thrown at people, but I thought that would be fun. So... Uh, we're on foot, about six of us, we're walking around the neighborhood, and we're throwing this, these fireworks into people's yards. And I don't know why we were on foot, that was a stupid idea. But I remember coming to one of the houses, and I remembering, wait, actually, guys, the one time I was playing football here with my mates, and this grumpy lady kicked me off this grass. We're throwing one here. So we're busy laughing while we're throwing this thing, making a big noise. We throw it in. We land in the veranda, so it makes a big echoing sound. Apparently, like seven of them had pacemakers. They woke up their kid that was sleeping. It was, it was intense, but we didn't know that. We were just laughing our heads off. So we go up towards, we, now we're sprinting away from them. We go into a four-way stop. Two of my friends go towards my house, which is the clever thing to do. But for some reason, I went the other way, and even if it was my house. Um, so we went right, and we're hiding behind a bush, about four of us. And this, we were there for about two, three minutes, and then we see these lights go into the bush. Then I just started running. My friends follow me. We just started running down the road, up the road. I, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I was about 20 meters ahead of everyone because this was my neighborhood. This is my neighborhood, so I'm not going to get caught. Um, and for some reason, I don't know how this bucky caught us because I honestly think it wasn't changing gear. Like it was in, it sounded like it was in first the whole time. It was like, whoa, whoa. And I'm wondering, is that got something to do with the gearbox or is that got something to do with my running? Like, I'm not sure which one, I, why I got caught, to be honest. But we got caught under a street light. Like, why did we stop under a street light? So we stopped under a street light, and this old grandpa, maybe like 75 plus, gets out the car, grabs my one friend, slaps him. His hat comes off his head, and while he's trying to regather the hat, he slaps him again. And in this moment, you guys, you guys are laughing. I was trying to not, not laugh because these people were upset with us. Um, and then this granny in the car slid her curls in her hair, you know those old-fashioned curls? And she says, hey, I recognize this kid. He's like, oh, why do we stop under the street lights and why do I have to have this color hair? That's what I'm thinking to myself. <laughs> like, everyone recognizes me. So they're like, we're going to your parents. So I go, uh, they, they drive off and I'm like, oh, whatever. We busy laughing our hats off, no pun intended. We laughing our hats off at this guy because his ears still ringing from this grandpa giving him a slap. And we're walking down the road, and then I see this dark figure come around the corner. And I'm like, who's that? But then I hear this, Keegan, you better hurry up, my boy. 
in that moment, I knew it was my dad. I, I'm not going to say I sprinted, but I, I walked very friskly. Um, <laughs> but just like I heard my dad's voice, we can hear the voice of the Father in heaven through spending time with him. If you want to know the voice of God, you need to spend time in his presence listening to him. I feel like another way we can hear God's voice and know it's God's voice is by reading the Bible because he's constantly declaring things over our lives in the Bible. In Joshua 1, 5, it says, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm not sure about you, but if I was in that situation like Joshua, I would be flipping motivated if he said that to me. The same thing, whatever situation you're going through, whatever circumstance you're in, you can turn to the Bible because he's declaring something and he's stating something over your life in positivity and prosperity in your life. Another, another way we can, we can know if it's God's voice is surrounding ourselves by godly friends. I often like see one of my friends, I'm like, no ways, Lord, how come you speak to him so much? Like, he's got so many words, every fusion he's got a word. It's so awesome to have friends like that, by the way. But then in the same moment, I'm like, hold on. I should surround myself with these people because if God's speaking so much to them, surely God can speak so much through them to me. So I think the biggest things are spending time in his presence, reading the Bible, and being surrounded by godly friends. It's all I got to do with this, tuning our ears to the frequency of heaven. And we can do that by those three ways. I really do believe God speaks to us about our calling. I really do believe God speaks to us about our anointing. But I also believe this, that the moment we step out of our comfort zone into uncomfortability, we walk into our calling. The moment we step from our comfort zone, the moment we step out of it, we step into our calling zone. In Joshua, we go back to Joshua 1, it says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to, the Joshua, to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan and all this people. I'm not sure about you, but Joshua was on the sidelines his whole life, second in command there next to Moses. And one day, Moses drops dead. Then he's in the firing line. Joshua must have been in such a place of unfamiliarity, unfamiliarity to move from sideline straight into the leading the battlefield, leading Israel. Because if you think about it, the only way Joshua stepped into his calling is stepping from the sideline and leading Israel. The same way when we step out of our comfortability, we step into our calling. It's like, it's like most of you guys here as well. I do believe lots of you guys have been called to, to preach and been anointed to preach. And it's, it's very comfortable where you're sitting. I can tell you it's very uncomfortable where I'm sitting right now. But one day, you're going to take that step from comfortability into uncomfortability and you're going to be able to walk in your calling. One day you're going to be on the stage preaching because you took that step into your calling. I believe I've been called to preach and I believe that I've been anointed to preach. And we better take that step from comfortability into uncomfortability to walk in our calling. It's like the thing of like a bird. If a bird wants to learn how to fly, it needs to leave the comfort of his mother's wings, right? If an eagle wants to learn how to soar through canyons and pick up fish with talons, what a poet. Um, he needs to be able to leave the comfortability of his mother's wings and learn how to fly. The same way we need to learn how to soar for Jesus by stepping into our calling. I think the greatest example of stepping into your calling from comfortability into uncomfortability is the disciples. I'm not sure about you, but if I, if I was one of the disciples and some random guy came up to me and said, hey, Keegan, listen, um, drop what you're doing, drop your living, um, come follow me, we're gonna kind of change the world. I'd be like, hold on, how do you know my name? And what's your name? That's what I'd be like. But they dropped what they did and they followed Christ. They moved from their comfortability. They were fishing nicely in the, Gal the Sea of Galilee, but they dropped what they were doing and they followed Christ. They left their comfortability and their security, not their security, but they left their comfortability and walked into their calling. Another big thing about, about our calling, we need to understand that our anointing and our calling is not determined by our past. God determines our anointing and our calling. Our past situations, our past circumstances do not determine our anointing. God does. I often ask God, God, how is it possible that you use me? How is it possible that you use a person like me that has messed up so many times in my life, messed up so much this week? But then I'm always, I'm always answered by this from God. The most humbling response ever. Keegan, are you seriously limiting me to that? 
Keegan, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, has your anointing, has your calling. Are you seriously limiting me to your past? I feel like I also get motivated when I look back in the Bible and I see Moses, a son of one of the most ruthless kings or pharaohs of Egypt, and he was also a murderer, but yet God used him to take his people out of Egypt. I look at David, he was an adulterer and a murderer, but yet it was one of the greatest kings God has ever anointed, a man after God's own heart. I also believe that, do you guys know Saul, right? You guys know Saul? Do you guys, does anyone have Instagram here? A few people. Let's, let's see a show of hands. Okay, cool. So if you guys don't have Instagram, there's something called Instagram bio. It's like a Facebook homepage for the old people, a Twitter, you know, account page. Um, you put your photo there, and if you're a good Christian boy, you put a scripture verse, a scripture verse, or, or you put a pastor's kid, or you put sportsman, or St. Charles, or GHS, or Epworth, whatever you put in your Instagram bio. Saul's Instagram bio would have been, in the spooky writing, Christian killer. But yet God used the Christian killer, turned him into Paul, and he helped change the world through the spirit of Jesus. If we look back to, the, to the, the story of Joshua in closing, we see Joshua send two spies into Jericho. Send two spies into Jericho, and they stayed at a prostitute's house. The prostitute hid them from the, from the guards coming to the gate. And when the, when the guards came to the prostitute's house, they said to them, listen, we know they, they came here, but where did they go now? And she says, I don't know. She lied to them. God used the lying prostitute to help the people walk into the land he had promised for them to be in. And my question in closing is this, if God is willing to use a lying prostitute, how much more is he willing to use you? It's, got, it's all got to do with this thing I've once preached on it before, it's God uses crooked sticks to draw straight lines. No matter how crooked your past, no matter how crooked the ways were before, God is gonna use that to draw a straight line into the calling and the promise he has for you. And we can be motivated and determined that the king of all kings is holding that anointing, holding that calling. If someone comes with his two cents, he's like, I don't care about that two cents. I don't care about their two cents because I'm holding your anointing and I'm holding your calling. Thank you.